six o'clock, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome everybody to the Museum of Discovery and Science Distinguished Speaker Series sponsored by the Save Our Seas Foundation. Uh, tonight we have our special guests, Dr. Guy Stevens and Dr. Emily Humble of the Manta Trust, talking about their work uh, with manta rays and genetics. Uh, but before we get started, just a few uh, rules if you've never attended one of these events before, or just a refresher if you have. Uh, we're going to keep everybody's microphones muted just to uh, uh, take out any interference from background noise and direct our full undivided attention to our special guests tonight. And uh, keep our, you know, you can have your cameras on or off as you're comfortable. It's nice to see some people's faces. Uh, if you're in uh, bedtime face or something, that's okay too. Uh, but at any point in the discussion uh, throughout the presentations, uh, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat. There's a button at the bottom center of the screen. You just open up that chat box and uh, type in whatever questions you can. We're going to come around uh, at the end after the presentations and uh, have a discussion. And that's your chance to uh, ask a scientist directly uh, to whatever you're thinking. So if anything interesting pops into your head at any point uh, during the presentations, uh, put them in the chat. We'll come back around to them at the end. So our guests tonight are Dr. Guy Stevens, who is the uh, founder of the Manta Trust, uh, one of the world's leading manta ray research organizations, and his associate, Dr. Emily Humble, uh, their uh, genetic specialist and research fellow at the University of Edinburgh. So she's joining us all the way from Scotland tonight. This is the second consecutive program. We've been going across the sea uh, and Dr. Guy Stevens is in Nova Scotia. So we are worldwide on the Distinguished Speaker Series uh, tonight for the second month in a row. Very exciting stuff. And it's good to see some of you tuning in from all over the country. So we're going to kick things off with Dr. Guy Stevens. He's going to tell us a little bit about their work at the Manta Trust and what they've been doing, uh, followed by Dr. Humble and then our discussion at the end. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stevens now. Uh, Dr. Stevens, welcome back to the program. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Brady. Um, hi, everyone. And um, yeah, I hope you will enjoy this evening's presentation. I'm going to try and share my screen now. This is the bit where it usually goes wrong. Hopefully, you guys can all see the presentation. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of uh, areas of, of focus. I think firstly, it would be helpful if I gave everyone a bit of an overview about manta rays for those who are not so familiar with, with these animals. And then I'll talk just briefly about myself and how I came to, uh, to found the Manta Trust and what that means to me and really how that led to this, this collaboration that encompasses a global um, you know, collection of, of people like Emily and myself and researchers, photographers, um, scientists and policymakers, et cetera, and, and how we all came together to try and, and help conserve these animals that we're all passionate about. And hopefully today um, you guys will learn a bit more about the work that we're doing and, uh, and hopefully that will give you an insight into the effort that goes into protecting uh, these species specifically. So um, to start off with, what exactly are manta rays? Well, they're within the same group as all of the other sharks and rays, and we call these animals the cartilaginous elasmobranchs. That's a bit of a mouthful, um, but essentially it's referring to the, the key uh, feature um, that, that kind of um, groups these animals together, and that's the, the that they all have this cartilaginous uh, skeleton. Most fishes have a, a bony calcium-based skeleton, about 35,000 species of fish or all throughout the world's so oceans and rivers, but about 1,400 or so of those um, have this um, predominantly cartilaginous skeleton. Um, and that's split roughly 50-50 between the, the sharks and the rays. They've been around for a very long time, hundreds of millions of years, over 400 or so million years for the sharks. And the group of, uh, of animals that we're going to kind of narrow in on, all of the rays, well, they've been around for about 200 million years. And they evolved from shark-like ancestors. And this flattened, squashed shape, essentially a sort of a flat shark, this is an adaptation predominantly to a life on the seabed. 
So most rays, when you think about them, stingrays and skates and eagle rays, this flattened shape came around because it helped you camouflage on the bottom of the sea, hide from predators and also hide from, from prey. But the group right, Dr. Siebers, with, excuse me if I could butt in. I, we're, uh, we're, just see, we're still seeing your uh, title slide. I'm not sure if that's ah, uh, supposed to be happening. Yeah, not. That's the strange. screen looks a little frozen, maybe. Or maybe uh, try switching to full screen again. What do you see now? Uh, let's look a little bit. It's got your notes and stuff on it. Uh, this, oh. uh, yeah. Um, strange. Try maybe stop sharing and resharing re again. Does this happen to you recently? Uh, I, <laughs> I can't remember the way around it, uh, but you know, yeah, I technical difficulties are okay. All right, let's try again. Do you just see my notes or do you see the full thing? Uh, right now, I, you're not uh, screen share. Now it says participants can see my screen. Yeah, yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, now it's on the title slide again in the window. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, maybe just, uh, yeah, see in the notes again, but. Space settings. All right. There we go. Looking good. We got it. Mm -hmm. Yes. All Sorry right. for the interruption, folks. No, uh, no, I would. <laughs> And we're back. <laughs> I don't want to go 15 minutes and then just be stuck <laughs> on the title screen. So um, I'll just recap that one. Essentially, yeah, manta rays belong to a group that contains all of the other sharks and rays. There's about 1,400 different species. The number changes all the time. I think this is something that uh, Emily will touch on in regard to, to manta rays later on anyway. And um, they've been around for, for a long time. Uh, hundreds of millions of years. And the group that we're going to focus in on now are the devil rays and the manta rays. Collectively, this is a family of 10. And I, I put that in question marks um, on the slide because actually taxonomically, we're still trying to understand how many species there are of mantas and, and their smaller cousins, the devil rays. Um, the genetics is, is still something that we need to look into more to, to really accurately define how many species uh, there are of these animals. And of course, that's fundamental to conservation management. So these animals, they are um, all large filter feeding uh, rays. They have this pelagic existence. So they swim through the open oceans uh, using their elongated pectoral fins, almost like birds um, that fly through the air. Manta rays almost like fly through the water. So these wing-like extensions to their pectoral fins, these big, uh, horny um, thinned heads that they use to funnel the food into their mouth. And there are two species of manta rays currently described, and there's likely to be a third species actually in the Caribbean, so off the coast of Florida um, and throughout the, west, uh, the rest of the Western Atlantic. We believe there's a third species of manta ray that hasn't yet been formally described. But the two that we currently have are the oceanic mantas. Um, as the name suggests, they tend to uh, prefer uh, deeper offshore waters. And these guys grow huge. So the biggest ever recorded was seven meters in, in wingspan. So that's the largest of all of the ray species and one of the biggest fish in the ocean. So that's a, a really colossal animal. Whereas the reef mantas, uh, they are distributed more in the Indo-West Pacific as the map uh, shows you there. And they're a little bit smaller. Uh, they can reach over four meters, four and a half meters, but the average individual is, is closer to three and a half or so meters. And as the name suggests, they're more associated with uh, reef habitats, so inshore coral reefs, continental shelves around tropical oceans. 
and, and all of these animals, all of the mobulids are found in, in tropical and subtropical oceans. And um, they all feed uh, on some of the ocean's smallest creatures, the zooplankton, little tiny crustaceans and uh, larval fish and other uh, animals within the, um, uh, the plankton community in the oceans. And they capture them with these uh, sieve-like um, gill plates. They swim them through the water with their mouths open and they, they sieve out the food as they passes over their, uh, the gill plates. And they also aggregate at predictable uh, locations like cleaning stations to have parasites and um, injuries cleaned by these small fishes, cleaner fishes. So manta rays are aggregatory. They aggregate at foraging sites and at these cleaning sites. And this also is a great place for people to interact with them, scientists, tourists, and so on. But it also makes them vulnerable um, to exploitation um, through things like fisheries. In terms of their reproduction, unlike most fish, which just produce lots of eggs and sperm, um, and relatively few of those offspring would survive to adulthood, manta rays invest an awful lot of energy in reproduction. Um, so the females undergo a year-long gestation. They give birth to just one pup. And when that manta ray is born, uh, it's over one and a half meters in wingspan. And you can see from the image on the bottom left, the really big belly and bulging uh, back of this pregnant female. So we can actually see the females when they're pregnant in the latter stages of their gestation. And um, we can see these young born mantas when they're, when they're born into the populations at about a meter and a half in size. So they have few offspring relatively infrequently. They live for a very long time and they aggregate in areas which makes them more vulnerable to exploitive uh, activities. And these combined make these animals quite vulnerable to, uh, to fisheries and other anthropogenic threats to the species. So some of the biggest and most uh, impactful threats are bycatch fisheries, so being caught uh, as a, an indirect product of other targeted fisheries like tuna and sharks. Manta rays get caught in gill nets, in purse nets. A lot of the net fisheries that are used to catch tuna Nowadays, we talk about you know, dolphin safe um, tuna. Well, it's not really manta safe. And unfortunately, a lot of these cans that you buy of, of skipjack tuna that have on the label dolphin friendly, unfortunately, they kill thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of manta rays and devil rays all around the world's oceans every year. So these, these bycatch fisheries are a big threat to, to manta rays. Incidental capture in mooring lines, in, in bather protection nets, sort of more harder to, um, to actually um, sort of equate the impact of the longer, lesser uh, measurable threats like the climate crisis. These are also things that we're really concerned about uh, for manta rays. And then there's also targeted fisheries. Fishermen that are going out specifically to hunt manta rays, uh, to capture them for their meat, and often actually uh, for their gill plates. So there is a demand in, in parts of Asia for the dried gill plates of the animals which are used as a, as a traditional medicine. And so this has led to targeted fisheries which have seen uh, populations of these animals decline in, in many locations where they occur. So that in summary is sort of a bit of the biology, um, the life history and some of the threats that these animals face. And, and now I quickly, because I realize we don't have too much time, what just wanted to talk about how I became um, passionate about manta ray conservation. So for me, it all started about 20 years ago now in the Maldives. I graduated from um, my undergraduate in marine biology in the UK, where I'm from. I got a job as a marine biologist to work in the Maldives. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. I couldn't really believe it. Someone was paying me to go diving and snorkeling uh, with manta rays. I was seeing them on a regular basis and I, you know, I fell in love with them. And the more you connect with an animal, the longer that you spend uh, in its world and looking into its life, the more you start to realize the problems associated with it. Unfortunately, most species face some threat um, that's often caused by humans. And um, so, you know, that led me to um, really the life that I lead today of manta conservation uh, and research. So for me, these animals are really a huge 
a vehicle that can draw people through the looking glass into the oceans. They help connect people to the oceans and they really make people care about um, these species and their habitats. And so, um, you know, if we care about them, um, then we're concerned about them when they're gone. And for me, that led to collaborations with colleagues all around the world. Thankfully, in the Maldives, these animals are not fished directly, they're indirectly um, threatened through uh, degradation of reefs, development, uh, the climate crisis, reducing availability of food and so on. But as I started to travel to countries like Sri Lanka and Indonesia to work with colleagues in those locations, I started to realize that these animals were, were disappearing. And I thought that there was a, an urgent need to form uh, a collaborative, structured approach to conserving these species and to use them as an umbrella um, under which we could protect the broader reef habitats that these animals depend upon. And that was really how the Manta Trust came to be formed. Um, and that was now 10 years ago. It's hard to, to think back that, that long. And in fact, Emily was one of the first um, uh, students, I guess, who came out to the Maldives. When was that, Emily? A long time ago. I'm sure you'll tell me eight, 10, year, 10 years ago. And, you know, back then, you know, I was working in the Maldives. I'd been running a Maldives focused project um, for about seven years at that point, but I felt it was time to expand out globally. And, you know, we started off with a few projects um, in, you know, five or six countries. And it's really grown now to a collaboration across the globe, wherever manta rays and their relatives occur in over 20 or so countries, 25 different countries. And it's only through this coordinated approach to conserving these species that we're able to achieve really effective conservation goals um, and, and, and actions. Um, for a species that is um, ranging across international borders, um, for a species that you know, we really need to study at a much larger scale than just one country if we're going to effectively protect it, um, it was really important for me to bring together people with a, a wide variety of skills, uh, not just the scientists, uh, but also people who are expert in communicating, people who can really uh, navigate the waters of policy, which is hugely important uh, from the top if you're going to affect uh, protective measures. But ultimately, if you're going to have effective conservation on the ground, you need to engage communities, you need to do a lot of education work. So a huge part of what we do at the moment is educating school children and uh, younger adults trying to engage communities and, and trying to really um, get people to, to, to want to protect these species. So that's really how the Manta Trust was born. And, you know, it's led to some really um, important conservation gains. We have uplistings on protective um, listings like the IUCN red lists. We have protections through international frameworks like CITES, which prevents trade in these species. And we have lots of national level protections, either species specific, like the Maldives. In fact, in the US now, um, the Oceanic Manta Ray is on the Endangered Species Act. Um, and we also have protected areas for manta rays in the Maldives and in Micronesia. So we have achieved a lot, but unfortunately populations have declined massively in many, many areas. Um, these animals are by no means um, safe now. And in fact, they're in a worse place than they were when I started. So um, we have a long way to go to protect them. And you know, the science um, is, a, is a really important tool in that process. And Emily is gonna talk now about how genetics plays an important role in understanding um, these species, understanding their tox taxonomy, um, but also how we're going to use that taxonomy and that knowledge of, of the genetic composition of the species and the populations to go about effectively protecting these species. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. And um, I'll hand it over to Emily after Brady, I think, maybe. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Stevens. Uh, yeah, I think you can remove screen sharing and we'll switch it over. Um, yes, absolutely. And thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, and congratulations on a decade of the Manta Trust. Uh, we just heard from Dr. Guy Stevens, uh, CEO and founder of the Manta Trust. And we're going to hear now from their genetic specialist, research fellow at the University of Edinburgh, uh, Dr. Emily Humble. Uh, 
Dr. Emily Humble, uh, welcome to the program. That's uh, you unmuted. Right. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you see that? That's good. So just the there's no notes or anything. It's the the, the main screen. Uh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Looks good to me. Okay, so thanks very much, Brady, and thanks for the good introduction to Manta Ray Sky. So my name is Emily Humble, and I'm from the University of Edinburgh in the UK. So it's, what's the time here now? It's half past 11 at night, so it's dark outside. And it's past my bedtime, so do bear with me. Um, and I'm a researcher in applied conservation genomics, which basically means that I look at the DNA of many different species, threatened species, endangered species. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in biology, and that's when I first found out about this area of conservation genetics. And when I finished my degree, as Guy said, I went out to the Maldives to work on the Maldivian Manta Ray project. And that's where I started to essentially combine these two interests of mine, marine biology and genetics. And we've been collaborating on the Manta Ray Genetics Project ever since then. So yeah, almost 10 years now. So I've also done a master's on shark genomics and I did my PhD on Antarctic fur seals. So I've worked on a number of different marine species, but today is obviously all about manta rays. And I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes or so just talking about how genetics can be used to improve our understanding of these amazing animals and help to contribute towards their conservation. So I'm actually gonna start off by trying to summarize how genetics fits into the bigger picture. So as Guy has highlighted, manta and devil ray populations are declining around the world due to both targeted and bycatch fisheries. And if this level of exploitation continues, we risk losing entire populations and potentially even entire species. Now, there are many different ways in which we could go about addressing this problem. So we could directly address the bycatch issue or we could work towards reducing international demand. And there are, of course, many people working around the world on these problems. But another really important approach is to ensure that any fishing and trade of manta and devil rays that is happening is happening in a sustainable way and that populations are managed effectively. And believe it or not, this is where genetic information can be really helpful because in order to develop appropriate management strategies, we need to know some really fundamental things about these animals. So for example, what is the population size of the oceanic manta ray? What's the population size of the species now? And what was it in the past? How many individuals um, of that species are being caught every month or every year in a certain location or all around the world? How are manta rays in the Indian Ocean connected to manta rays in the Pacific Ocean? How many manta ray species are there? What is it that we're actually trying to protect? Now, because these animals are so elusive, these fairly fundamental and basic questions are actually relatively tricky to address. But manta ray DNA can provide us with a really valuable window into these areas, which can help support conservation management and then ultimately help prevent further population declines. And I'm gonna come back to these specific questions a little bit later, but first of all, you might be wondering, how do you get DNA from a manta ray? So there are two main ways in which we do it. The first is by cutting a small amount of tissue from animals that have been caught and landed in fish markets. And these situations actually provide very good opportunities for collecting tissue samples because unfortunately large numbers of animals are being caught on a regular basis. The second way in which we do it is to take a sample from a live animal underwater. So we do this using a pole, it's a very quick process, it doesn't harm the animal, but it provides us with a very small but very fresh piece of tissue, which um, for certain purposes is really useful. 
So once we've got this tiny little bit of tissue, we put it in a tube that contains alcohol and then it is then stored in the freezer. And this is so that the tissue is preserved because as soon as we take that sample, the DNA will start to degrade. So we need to make sure that we keep it protected for as long as possible. So next up, we take the sample to a laboratory setting where we follow a set of instructions, like a recipe, like in baking a cake, basically. We add lots of ingredients, we mix it up, we heat it up, cool it down again. And we basically end up with a little tube that you can see on the right here that contains the DNA from that tissue or from that animal. But at this stage, we can't really do very much with it. It's still in the tube. We kind of need it to be on our computer so that we can read it and so that we can actually analyze that information. And we do that by using DNA sequencing machines that spit out information that looks something like this. So this is essentially what DNA, what DNA code looks like. And in the last decade, DNA sequences have got so powerful that we can now read the entire genome of an animal in a relatively short period of time. Whereas in the past, we would only really be being looking at very small sections of it. So it's a little bit like reading a book. So imagine somebody gave you some random sections of a couple of sentences from a book. You probably wouldn't really be able to get a good idea as to what was going on. Whereas if you got the la you know, large proportion of that book, you'd have a much better idea of the story. And it's this genome wide approach equivalent that we refer to as genomics as opposed to just genetics. So I'm gonna be using this term a few times going forward. So as you can imagine, having all of this genomic information gives us so much more power to reliably answer questions. So for example, genomic data can help us to resolve taxonomic uncertainties, particularly in groups of closely related species where genetic differences are actually really subtle. And this is the case in manta and devil rays. Genomics can also help us to measure how different populations are connected. We can estimate both historical and contemporary population sizes with genetic data. And we can also reliably carry out species identification on samples with unknown origin. And this is really important for monitoring the manta ray and mobula trade, for example. And as you will remember, these are the questions that I mentioned to you at the beginning that we really need to get a better understanding of in order to inform conservation management. And over the past years, we've been focusing on the top two questions here. So resolving taxonomic uncertainties, how many manta ray and devil ray species are there? And then also looking at population structure in manta rays. How are different populations connected over the world? And I'm gonna briefly summarize some of our findings for you now. So for the taxonomy study or the phylogenomics study, we collected over 100 samples from almost 20 different sites all over the world. And this was really made possible due to the global network of researchers um, that were connected through the Manta Trust. And the, all of the different locations are, um, are shown on the map here in different colored circles. And we sequenced all of these samples using this genome-wide genomic approach. And we then compared all of the genetic sequences to each other. And what did we find? So first off, our results support previous findings that manta rays, and you can see those are the top, the top group um, of the slide here, are actually nested within the mobular ray family tree. So the, fa the family tree that you see here is the mobular the mobular family tree or taxonomy. And so this finding further supports the slight renaming of this group of animals that happened a couple of years ago. Our results also support the recent resurrection of a species of pygmy devil race. This is a small devil race species which had previously been lumped together with another species, but we can now confidently say that it's different enough and should be monitored and managed separately. So as you can tell, these findings actually really do have quite direct implications for conservation management. 
And finally, our results provided the first genomic evidence for a new species of manta ray in the Gulf of Mexico. So this, of course, is the Caribbean manta ray, which you guys might be familiar with. Guy mentioned this species earlier. And so this really contributes to a growing body of evidence that a third species of manta ray really does exist. Now, in order to develop suitable protective measures, it's really important that a formal description of this species is carried out. So this is, um, yeah, this is the next step that needs to happen so that researchers can use this basis to then properly determine the distribution of the species, for example, which may or may not extend into international waters or into areas of high fishing pressure. So finally, I want to touch upon some of our very recent work looking at population structure and connectivity of oceanic and reef manta rays. So this time we collected over 200 samples from both of these species, again, from, as much, from across as much of their distributions as we could. And you can see our sampling locations um, by the yellow and red circles on the map here. And again, we sequenced these using a genome-wide approach, and we compared all of the DNA sequences to each other. So what did we find here? Well, for the reef manta ray, we find evidence for geographically separate populations, with samples collected from the Indian and the Pacific Oceans clustering apart. So you can see this on the figure here. Um, by the points on the left and the right, corresponding to samples that were collected in these two oceans. And actually within these two groups, there's further, further structuring and further separation going on. So you can see that animals from Hawaii are separating apart from animals from Australia and Fiji. And then on the other side, we've got some separation between the Maldives, Chagos and the Seychelles. So overall, this suggests that there is restricted movement um, and gene flow between ocean basins in the reef manta ray, but also restricted movement and limited gene flow on a more local scale as well. In contrast to this, for the oceanic manta ray, we find no pattern of population structure, suggesting that we might actually be seeing a completely panmictic population. And this is quite a striking pattern, and it indicates that these animals are potentially undertaking long range migrations between ocean basins. And this is something that was, you know, for a long time was thought to be the case. The species common name is oceanic manta ray after all, but we've really not had the evidence to make this distinction or there's been conflicting evidence to date. So of course, these results are interesting from a biological perspective perspective, but they also have really important implications for management, because in this case, the reef manta ray would clearly benefit from more local or national management, whereas the, for the oceanic manta ray, it will be more important that management is implemented at a much broader scale. So these, as I said, are relatively new results. We're writing them up now, and we hope to have them published soon. So if you're interested in uh, in this part of the talk, then do keep your eyes peeled if you'd like to find out more. So to summarize, genetics can provide a really valuable window into fundamental questions that can help feed into conservation management decisions. And by working with researchers all over the globe as part of this Manta Trust network, we've been able to establish a fantastic biobank of Manta and Devil Ray samples genetic samples. And so far we've used these to reconstruct the family tree of manta and devil, ray, manta and devil rays, so evaluating the different species boundaries. And we've uncovered patterns of population structure or not within manta ray species. And both of these things have got really important implications for management. So to finish off, I'd first just like to acknowledge Dr. Jane Hosgood, who actually carried out a lot of this work during her own PhD, as well as both the funders, especially, of course, to the Save Our Seas Foundation and to all of the other collaborators, without which this project would certainly not have been possible. And thanks to you guys for, all, for your attention.
Okay, thank you, Dr. M Emily Humble uh, from University of Edinburgh and the Manta Trust. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions now. So if you have any questions uh, about anything we've touched on tonight or anything that uh, uh, you didn't hear about, uh, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat now. Uh, and we're going to uh, open it up to questions. I, I'm going to start with a couple. Uh, if Emily, if you want to stop screen share and we'll uh, get a bit more cozy here. All right. Uh, all right, now it's time to open it up to questions to uh, Dr. Guy Stevens and Dr. Emily Humble. Uh, first one coming in is coming from a uh, uh, long time listener, first time caller, uh, Marlo and Deb uh, wanna know, uh, how long does it take for a manta ray to reach uh, sexual maturity? This could be for either one. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and, and the jury is still out somewhat. Um, however, we've, we're now pretty confident that it's within about, uh, I would say, for a wild um, reef manta where we have the best data, it's about 10 years for males, 10, 11 years, and about um, 15 years for females, so a long time. And what would be uh, like a general, uh, like average lifespan uh, for any of these species? And is there a difference between uh, any of the subspecies we talked about. So we, we we really only have good data on the reef mantas. These are the species where on all of this information about you know age and size and maturity and, and longevity comes from photo ID reciting databases. So because we can identify every individual, we can repeat cite them year after year, decade after decade. In these animals that are frequenting the same sites again and again, and where we have these long-term data sets like the Maldives, we're now starting to get to the point where we can be confident that these animals are, you know, are, you know, going from birth to maturity, and then, you know, at what stage and age they start to leave or disappear from a population. So it's about 45 years is what we think would be the, the sort of average lifespan for a reef manta ray, but it could well be much longer than that. Um, but I think I would I would guess 40 to 50 is a, is a probably a pretty good ballpark for how old the average reef manta gets. And we can assume that oceanic manta is probably something similar, but it could be longer. We don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, I got a, and a couple more coming in here. Linda wants to know uh, how many offspring would be ex the expected number in a one, group? One time. Just one at a time. Yeah. And do the uh, do manta rays have multiple uh, offspring then, or uh, is so it just the, a one and done? The, the maximum potential. I mean, it is technically possible that they could have um, because they have u two uteruses. They could they could have um, one pup in each uteri, but it seems unlikely. What we think might be happening, and this is a theory I've been working on for a long time, which, which are now able to start to address because we have this new technology, these underwater ultrasounds, these contactless ultrasounds. So we've developed this in partnership with Cambridge University and Vetsonics, and we can actually go underwater and, and scan a manta ray without actually having to touch it. So we can hold the scanner you know, a few inches apart and we can actually scan and see the, the, the developing um, embryos inside the, the mothers. And my thought is that it's possible that they could have different embryos in different stages of development that might enable them to, to have potentially offspring more regularly than, um, than one pup every year. However, in reality, these animals are undergoing gestations much less frequently than that because on average, there's less food around. It's an extremely uh, intensive uh, energy sapping process. I mean, just look at humans, right? If you're going to give birth to a child, often women um, have a break in between just to, to you know, to recover. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same with manta rays. Yes, if it's really productive, they could have one pup every year, but in reality, their average is more like once every three or four or five years. So across the lifespan, a female might be most reproductively fecund across a 10-year period where she gives birth to half a dozen or so pups. And then either side of that, maybe just a few, a few more offspring. So over the lifespan, we're really talking about just a handful of, of pups. Great. And uh, here's an interesting question from Sunny. Uh, can manta rays swim backwards? Uh, no, they cannot. And they are born into a life of 
perpetual motion. So um, from the, the second they're born until the, the moment they die, these animals have to keep swimming. Now, a slight caveat to that is if they're in a very strong current, they can almost hover. I mean, we see this where they will literally sort of hover in the current, but the water is still passing through their mouth and over their gills. That they can sort of sort of do a tail drop and sink. So I guess you could say that's them going backwards, but they can't actively, you know, rotate the movement and swim backwards. I mean, we can see this in stingrays where they can change the direction of the ripple and they can kind of move around like this, but a no, a manta ray, it, it, it swims forward and that's its only direction of, of travel. And that's why they get caught in nets so easily because they swim into a net, they cannot then back out of it. They, they have to keep going forward. And when they push forward or they try to roll backwards or flip out of it, that's when they get tangled up in the fishing line. And so in the lines and the hooks, they easily become entangled. And then they can't get any water passing over their gills because they can't travel forward anymore. And they literally, they die from a lack of, of oxygen getting into their bloodstream. So they don't die from the injuries, they die because they just can't breathe anymore. Um, and this is the, the biggest cause of, of mortality when they get captured in these nets. Wow, yeah, that's, I wouldn't have thought of that, but uh, it makes sense. That's a, I, I know a lot of uh, shark species also uh, have the same issue, uh, the having to, uh, to keep moving. Uh, if you come to the Museum of Discovery and Science, the dogfish sharks that we have here uh, do not have to keep swimming. Uh, so they're okay, even if they're, <laughs> you don't have to ask me. Uh, great question. This is uh, one probably uh, more relevant to uh, Emily's research in tracking, um, it's talking about individuals and where they're located. Are mantas uh, like sea turtles in the sense where they might return to uh, uh, maybe uh, to a certain spot like sea turtles, uh, which is a big thing here in South Florida, will often return to the same beach to nest every year and it's often where they hatch. Uh, do manta rays have or have you seen any anything like that of manta rays having uh, that kind of tracking or navigation skill? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So this is one of the uh, main distinctions between these two species. So the reef manta rays are much more residential and they do return to the same place year after year. Um, and this is reflected in some of the genetic results that we found that these groups of animals are genetically also very different. Whereas for the oceanic manta ray, they're less likely to um, yeah, that they're less resident essentially. So, and this, yeah, you, you know, this connects to this genetic pattern that we see that there is this possibility that they are traveling over further, further areas. They're not, you know, stuck in, in, in the same, in the same location. And it's like, you know, it's like all animals. There's a, there's a you know, um, there's a sliding scale of, of behaviors. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've been lucky enough for 20 years now to go to the same places in the Maldives and, and, and many other locations. And I, I see the same manta rays I saw 20 years ago. And it's lovely to go back and see, you know, your old friends. I and mean, I say it, you know, because I genuinely mean it. These animals have very distinct personalities. You recognize individuals because they have these unique spot patterns. So we immediately get to see them. Some of them are extremely bold and curious. And so when you see them, you know, you can often, you know, get very close to them and they'll come and check you out. So yeah, they're repeatedly visiting the same foraging sites, the same cleaning stations year after year after year. Uh, and they may move between like a summer home and a winter home because there's seasonal variations in productivity. They also might move because of, of reproductive needs so go to give birth somewhere or go to, to mate. Um, but generally they have a very high propensity to return to the same locations again and again and again. And why wouldn't you, if you've got safety, plenty of food, um, protection from predators, um, opportunities to reproduce, you're not gonna go very far, but some individuals decide, you know what, I wanna get out of here. I wanna go and find somewhere new. Uh, and we have one manta ray that, that, um, that was in the news recently because it turned up in Cocos Island. So that's off the, uh, the coast of, of, of the Americas. And that animal is the only individual reef manta ray that's ever been recorded uh, east of Hawaii or French Polynesia. So that's like thousands and thousands of kilometers away from the nearest known population of reef manta rays. So where did that manta ray come from? You know, it, it's actually was recently seen again by a, a friend of mine just a few weeks ago. So three years now, it's been in this little island, Cocos, 
in the middle of the Pacific, presumably without seeing any other reef manta rays. And, uh, you know, so these animals can travel huge distances. We know that. Um, and the flip side, like Emily was saying, is some oceanic manta rays, we believe at some part of their life stage, appear through the genetics to be traveling much larger distances than the average reef manta ray. But within populations that we're studying of these oceanic manta rays, like um, around the Ravia Hijiros archipelago in Mexico, again, we have oceanic mantas that are seen every year for 20, 30 years, and they appear to be very resident to these, uh, these islands. So it's not so clear cut. You know, there's lots of variation, but as a general trend, yeah, you know, these animals definitely have um, a propensity to go back to the same places again. Interesting, yeah. Uh, here's a great question, uh, the, uh, the, maybe for either of you. Uh, Ashley wants to know, uh, as far as ecotourism, like diving and snorkeling, and especially since uh, you can maybe predict like where you might see manta rays if they uh, kind of come to the same areas, uh, do you think that is beneficial towards manta ray conservation or is the traffic of uh, humans and boats and things like that uh, uh, directly more damaging? Um, I mean, like all these things, unfortunately humans um, have often a negative impact on these species. But, you know, if we're gonna, you know, you, you can't, manta rays don't live in a vacuum away from humans. And in, in, in pretty much in every part of their, their range, you know, humans um, interact with them, they affect their, their lives. And certainly when it comes down to um, trying to equate how best to go about managing and protecting a species, it often comes down to, to resource management. And governments will put an economic value on a species um, and it's much much better a million times better to value those animals through tourism activities than it is through exploitative fisheries activities so tourism comes with its problems yes um, we have issues with animals being hit by speedboats with you know development of resorts degrading the reef habitats that they live in people touching the animals scaring them away from the places that they aggregate to to forage and to reproduce etc but that flip side of that is a huge revenue generated from the sustainable um, continuation of these populations that the people come to see. So these animals are valued, therefore they're more likely to be protected. Um, and you have a, a massive opportunity to engage people with these animals, to have the privilege to be in the water close to one of these giant creatures. And that experience leads to a much greater, um, you know, awareness of and um, uh, desire to spread the conservation message and you know that for me is definitely overall on balance a best you know a good outcome for these animals so tourism should be managed it needs to be properly um, undertaken but it's not a bad thing in itself very good yeah that's a i, I mean yeah that's a, a loaded question i, I imagine but uh uh, here's a good one uh, from David. This one's for Emily. Uh, can you use the genetic data you collect to identify specific nursery areas? That's a good question. And it's it's not something that, that we're doing. And I think technically it's something that you could potentially look at by, because one of the things that you can do with genetic data is to look at relatedness between individuals. So it's not something that I discussed in the talk, but um, obviously more closely related individuals are going to be more similar genetically and this might be something that um, might give you an indication of nursery areas if you're you know, finding lots of relatedness between lots of different individuals but collecting enough genetic data from one location from these animals is is still pretty difficult. Um, the samples that I was talking to you about took many many years to collect um so i think realistically in this species it's probably a yeah one question that it, it might just be a little bit too too difficult to do although when it comes to looking at relatedness between animals there are certain populations where we do have a lot more a, many more samples from individuals so we could definitely start to look at you know, like a pedigree 
or this kind, kind of thing across the generations. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, one, I just would add to that, that it's an important one because for, for reef mantas, we, we are able to study the adult and the juveniles relatively easily. We, we can identify these juvenile populations. We can collect tissue samples from them. Colleagues working in, in Indonesia, in Raja Ampat, um, have been able to identify you know, these, these nursery areas. We know, we know of them in the Maldives. But for oceanic mantas, it's much harder because generally, you know, a good example would be the Caribbean is in places like Florida, um, we have lots of juvenile mantas around the inshore coastal areas of, of the southeast um, USA and also around some of these oceanic islands in the Caribbean. And then you go down to the Yucatan and there's only the adults of what we believe to be this Caribbean species. But we have no idea how these populations or population is interconnected. So one of the things we really want to do is, yes, collect samples from across this region of adults and juveniles and start to see, are the juveniles that are in Florida part of the same population of these adults that we are studying in the Yucatan down in Mexico? And obviously, if that's the case, then we need to really think about management on a much bigger scale, going back to the discussions about how we protect the species in a population. We really need to think about things on a, on a, you know, on a population wide scale for, for these animals. Um, and, and on another slight separate point to this general theme, but an important one is understanding population structure, um, you know, within living animals is really important. But what we also are trying to look at is animals in the trade. So if we can go and collect a sample. So going back to what Emily said, firstly, how, how are these species structured? So once we know what species exist, that's great. And then we look at within the population of each species. And we've only really just done this for mantas. We'd love to do it for all of the other devil rays too, because they're equally as threatened and, and impacted, but there's a lot less effort focused on fishing them. But once you then can start to look into the, the detail of the structure of the population, you can go into the trade and collect samples of the gill plates of these animals where they're being consumed or from the meat in the markets, because Animals that are landed in markets in Sri Lanka are not necessarily fished in Sri Lankan waters. They're often fished across the Indian Ocean and, you know, a completely other um, part of the, of the world. You can take then genetics from those animals and those gill plates and you can put them into these uh, population matrices and we can start to identify where the traded animals that are being fished uh, and consumed in gill plate uh, trades are coming from. And then, of course, that has a whole implication for fisheries management as well. So, yes. Genetics at a, at a population level helps you really um, understand how to manage effectively a species and how to conserve it. Excellent. Uh, another question for Emily. Uh, this one is for from Eleonora. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hope I pronounced this right also. Uh, do you use paraffin for tissue? No, we don't. We use... Um... We use ethanol, we use really high concentration, lab grade ethanol in most cases. Um, there are a couple of other different preservatives that we might use depending on um, our downstream analysis plans, but generally ethanol is the preservative that, that we use. Great, and uh, here's another one from Ashley. Uh, when you're gathering tissue samples, do you also uh, have a way of tagging the individual or is tagging uh, manta ray something that you do to track or is that? Um, uh, yeah, that so work? I'm not involved in any tagging studies, but there are certainly researchers out there that will tag an animal and collect a genetic sample at the same time. Obviously when samples are taken from um, live animals in the water will always try to take um, an ID photo to sex the animal and get as much extra information as possible and the same goes for collecting samples from fishery specimens so we will collect as much extra information from that specimen as possible so the sex of the animal the disc the disc width the yeah, but basically as much metadata as we can because we never we never know how it will how we'll be able to use it in the future. There are, of course, some cases where, yeah, it's it's just impossible to get that information. Um, but no, we definitely try and try to get as much as we can. Yeah, and are the uh, uh, 
color patterns uh, unique enough to each individual that you can uh, rely on like a photo idea to, or like a, a guy was saying, seeing the same manta rays over 20 years or so, are there patterns unique enough to where, um, or how, how do you recognize the individual after all that time? Yeah, it's it's that spot patterns I'll hand over to Guy because that's really the basis of the Moldavian manta ray project is this ability to be able to <laughs> identify individuals through time. Ah. Yeah, I have a handy, in fact, do I have another one? Oh yeah. There's handy visual aids there, yeah. I mean, these are these are two, I mean, these are these are modeled on real mantas, this one's Storm. Um, you know, they're born with these black spots on their oh. predominantly white bellies, and it's like a fingerprint. So the manta ray, from, from the moment it's born, we can take a picture of it, we can, you know, plug this into our, our software that can help to identify the individual. We also spend a lot, have a lot of, volunteers and staff, that's what Emily was doing 10 years ago. You take hundreds of pictures, sometimes thousands of pictures in a day. Some of the aggregation sites, we're very, very lucky in the Maldives to have a huge population. We can see sometimes 100, even 200 individuals in one day. So you can imagine we have to go through all of those sightings, record all of the information, put that into a big database. And we've now collected, I think it's close to 100,000 sightings of, of, of about four and a half thousand reef manta rays in the Maldives. And when we put all that together, we can get a really, uh, really complex picture of the population. So how many males, females, where they're going, what they're doing, how often they're reproducing, how often they're getting injuries, are they being hit by boats or they're being bitten by sharks? Um, these, kind of, uh, these kind of levels of information that really come about because we can identify every individual from these spots that don't change from, from birth to death. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, got a few minutes left. Got time for one more question. I have one more question from me, actually. Uh, curious about uh, the emergence of the Atlanta manta species that we've been hearing about, because uh, here in South Florida, uh, we've been just anecdotally seeing more and more manta rays around. I have some friends that go paddle boarding a lot and see manta rays. I saw uh, what I'm guessing might have been this species of manta ray leaping out of the water uh, just off the beach uh, uh, near where I live in Pompano Beach. Um, what should we, is there any kind of citizen science things or like what should we be looking out for? How can we maybe differentiate those from say a devil ray, which may be a bit more common? Um, and yeah, what, 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 what's some things we, we might want to know about uh, this Atlantic manta ray? Yeah, good question. To address the sort of the latter part of your question, first, the size is really going to be the key to helping you discern whether it's a manta ray or whether it's a, one of the, the devil rays. So in in sort of around your, your neck of the woods, the species that you're most likely to be seeing of devil ray would be um, the Atlantic pygmy devil ray. And they max out at around about one meter in, in wingspan. Um, they're often quite often found uh, really in shallow waters along the, the beaches, mangrove areas and, and coastal areas, but anything over one and a half meters in wingspan, if you see a big triangular shaped ray, it's a manta. Okay, uh, yeah. Even the that, smallest, yeah. So yeah, this was know, much bigger than one, one meter, yeah. And they, they do breach quite a lot and they'll mm -hmm. jump out of the water and splash back down. And we think they're doing this to, to communicate. So, um, you know, I, I studied this for my PhD and. Um, have some colleagues working on how they're able to, to potentially use uh, sound waves that travel through the water. These big breaches might be a way for them to signal to other animals uh, in the water. So breaching is a really fascinating behavior that, that you might see. So yeah, if you see a manta ray, just the fact that you've seen it um, or you've seen a devil ray, then by sending that sighting information uh, to the scientists who are working in your region. And actually in Florida, there is um, a marine megafauna project. I think it's called the Florida Manta Project. It's, it's run by Jessica Pate. Um, Jessica is doing really good work on uh, the local Florida manta population. She's been, uh, she's been collecting photo IDs of the individuals there. She's amassed now, I think maybe, I think it's 70 or 100 or something individuals. Nearly all of these are juveniles. Um, so she's recording the individuals. If, you, if you're able to get a picture of it, 
Um, and what we want is a picture of these spot patterns on the belly, which might be hard to do, but you know, um, you know, if you're able to get close to it, maybe it flips so up and shows you its belly, or you're able to free dive down, please do so in a responsible manner. And there's lots of guidelines about how to do that on our website. But if you're able to get a spot pattern or even just a picture of it, you can send it to Jessica's project, um, or you can send it to the Mans Trust and we'll pass it on to Jessica. Um, and it will then go into her database. It will go into her database of, of individuals, um, and that will be used to help understand that, that population regionally. And yet, yeah, Jessica is also doing satellite tagging, uh, tagging to try and track the movements of those individuals. And you know, we want to collaborate on that ocean scale basin to try and understand the population structure of these animals too. So. Absolutely. If you see a manta, you can contribute to the science and every sighting is important. Excellent. Uh, I hope everybody else heard that out there. I'll definitely be keeping my eyes open. Uh, my sighting was a very momentary one. It breached the water quite a, <laughs> quite a bit and was uh, uh, much larger than uh, one meter. It was maybe only about 50, 60 meters from the, from the shoreline. So it was uh, quite, uh, quite an experience, but I'll be looking out for that. Uh, for sure, and sending all relevant information. And I would, if you've had one like jump out of the water and land next to you, I, I've had it happen several times where this, you know, one ton animal is literally crashed down onto the surface of the water. You know, it, you think a bomb's gone off next to you because it's yeah. such a huge, loud sort of like crash. And that, that really is a spectacular thing to see. Um, so yeah, do look out for mantas breaching uh, off the coast. If you see a big splash, uh, it could well be a manta. Great information. Uh, we'll be uh, looking out for that. I certainly will be. Uh, fascinating to see and learn about these animals. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stevens, for joining us again. Uh, Dr. Humble, thank you for joining us for the first time. Uh, thank you for uh, braving the late night. Uh, <laughs> it's been tough for me to stay up past my bedtime lately as well. Uh, and yeah, thank you uh, both for joining us and uh, congratulations again on 10 years of the Manta Trust uh, for everybody else. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, thank you for um, uh, coming through with a lot of great questions tonight. Uh, and feel free to join us next time. We have another virtual Save Our Seas Distinguished Speaker Series event coming up uh, October 7th, I believe. We'll be talking about sharks and some of our uh, uh, friends down here in the region, a more local showcase, and then talking about uh, sea turtles here on site, sea turtle season wrap up with Dr. Derek Burkholder that's coming in early November. Keep an eye on our website for details for that and uh, for other upcoming events and programs here at the Museum of Discovery and Science. Thank you once again to Dr. Guy Stevens and Dr. Uh, Emily Humble for joining us and presenting tonight. Thank you for to the Save Our Seas Foundation for making this possible and all of you for tuning in. I'm Brady Newbill at the Museum of Discovery and Science in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, signing off. Everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks, Brady. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you.